you own something that's real, that is essential of universal value and can be sold in whatever currency is working at that particular time. So that's a very, very simple hedge strategy that incorporates the elimination of counterparty risk. Welcome. You're listening to the Apartment Investing Show. This is where you'll learn how to start or scale your apartment investing career. Your host, Adam Adams, challenged himself to do a 100-day raw vegan diet, but he gave up on day 91. Adam and his guests will show you how to create residual income by investing in apartment communities. Now, here's your host, Adam Adam AAA AAA Adams. Adams. I'm excited today because we have Russ Gray from the Real Estate Guys radio show since... 1997. I just saw that. that It's been since 1997, Russ? Yeah, Robert and another guy started the show in 1997. I heard it in 2001 and went to a seminar that uh, he and his partner were putting on. And that's where I first met Robert. And shortly thereafter, I started speaking at his seminars. We began doing some cooperative marketing. I had a mortgage company back then. He was in the brokerage business. And uh, the original co-founder of the show inexplicably quit in uh, the summer of 2004. I became the de facto temporary co-host, and I've been the temporary co-host since uh, June of 2004. That is interesting. I like that. I'm really excited because I know you guys are really crushing it. Everything that you've you've been doing, you've been putting out tons of content, helping a lot of people. And it's an honor to have you on the show. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks um, for having me. Happy in, to be here. in 2004, you became the co-host of the show. And you and Robert, and maybe another partner, I think you were doing a ton of things. So you had a lot going on. And in, in 2008, something happened. Um, and I want to kind of have that part of the story for the show. I want to really talk about you know, what happened to you guys in 2008 or what you saw in, in real estate in 2008. Because as we're interviewing today, um, COVID happened. And I feel like that the... Um, the market's been you know, propped up for a long time. It's been going up for a long time. And uh, a lot of people have been expecting a crash. However, there's some really smart people that say COVID's not a big deal. It's going to be a V curve. It's going to be over in a little bit. Um, but I'm a little bit more skeptical. And so I'd like to have you on the show and just kind of get some of your thoughts, add some context to what's going on. So just dive into... I guess your story, the history, what, what was going on through them from, you know, 2002, 2004, 2008, and yeah, what do you sure. think might be happening now? Well, I, I, I think just a little backstory on me. I, if I have a claim to fame or a skill, uh, I, tend to, I tend to be forward thinking and I'm a bit of a strategist. So I kind of figure out how to position myself ahead of the curve. You know, Wayne Gretzky said, you know, when he was asked about his skating, like, well, his, his, he was a famous hockey player for those who don't know. And he would say, well, what's the secret to your success? And he said, I, I skate to where the puck is going. And it's about anticipation. So, uh, you know, I was in corporate sales in Silicon Valley in the 1990s. And as we were approaching Y2K and you know, I'd been through being told that we were going to run out of fossil fuels by the year 2000. I'd been told that we were going to have a new ice age uh, by the 21st century. I heard that Y2K was going to just destroy all the computers and civilization as we know it. And so there was all that going on. But when I looked at what was kind of going on in the, in the realm of money, I saw the baby boomers being the most powerful force demographic force out there. And Harry Dent wrote a book called Roaring 2000s, and it was based on the demography. And I was reading that to get an alternating, uh, alternative viewpoint to this idea that the world was coming to an end in the year 2000, right? And so I kind of began to understand demographics, and I combined that with my love of economics and money and realized that in a conventional financial planning model, the baby boomers were going to move from equities to uh, bonds, And as they moved over to bonds, uh, they would bid up the price of bonds through demand, and that meant interest rates would come down. And if you looked at the interest rates from the time that uh, Paul Volcker, then chairman of the Fed, kind of broke the back of inflation post the uh, 1970s default on the gold standard uh, and the dollar collapsing the first time, um, you know, we had interest rates. Primary, it was 21%. My very first rental property, my interest rate was only 13%. 
So, you know, the interest rates had been falling. So I said, okay, there's going to be a lot of uh, money coming into bonds, a lot of money to lend. There's going to be lower interest rates. Equity is going to happen, which is ultimately what we ended up naming our book. And so based on all of that, I decided to get into the mortgage business in the year 2000. And so I started a mortgage company and everybody told me I was crazy because that's when they first started uh, internet commerce and online and everybody said, oh, everybody's going to order their mortgages online like they do books from Amazon because Amazon was only a book company back then. I said, no, I don't think so. I think people are going to are going to want to have, you know, a strategist, uh, somebody who's going to work through the math with them and think about that. And I really became focused on my corporate background and, and doing the math and the math showing you what to do and, and all that. So long story short, I got into the mortgage business. I decided to focus on real estate investors. I went out into the marketplace and started listening to people who were in the space in Silicon Valley. Robert Helms was on the radio with the Real Estate Guys radio show. And I went to one of his seminars and was looking for uh, to get into a relationship to do some cooperative marketing. And he and I just hit it off. And so the mortgage company did great. And it was great from 2000 to 2008. And along the way, we got a book, a TV show. I became the host of the radio show. We built a big educational company. We started a real estate development company. We started a referral brokerage company. Robert and his dad already had a brokerage company. So we had like seven or eight different business units all operating, 50 employees, 50,000 square foot building, overhead, half a million a month. I mean, it was just ridiculous, right? This all happened in a very short period of time. Houses, cars properties everywhere. We were in, investing in three different countries and it was all great right up until September 2008 when the bottom fell out. And what I had constructed was a personal portfolio that was largely speculative. Uh, it was based on the idea that real estate would go up, 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 and I would be able to continually access inexpensive financing to pull equity out. And then I could use that for additional down payments and to, and to subsidize negative cash flow. I had a mortgage company making me seven figures. So I was sitting great. When the mortgage company stopped, then the flaw in my model was exposed. I was 100% dependent on credit markets. I had no cash, none. I had a half a million dollars of various credit lines I operated my business on, paid them off every month. And I was uh, brokering credit. We were developing on credit. We were selling the takeout inventory to investors or uh, buyers, you know, users on credit. And when credit died, everything died. And now my negative cash flow is this giant millstone around my neck with no credit in the market. All the air came out of the prices because a lot of the equity you have in real estate is based on the uh, ready availability of financing. That's, that's the bubble part of it. And when it goes away, so does that equity. Now you're upside down, which is fine if you can handle the cash flow, but I couldn't. So everything unraveled very, very quickly. And so I sat there at the end of that and I thought to myself, you know what? I, I'm a hard worker. I, I'm, I'm maybe not the sharpest guy in the world, but I'm not the, the dullest tool. I clearly have not been paying attention to something I should have been paying attention to. So Robert and I went on a quest. We wanted to figure out, well, who knew? How did they know? And how can we learn from them? And that's where we, uh, we found Peter Schiff. And Peter had written a book in uh, 2004 or five called Crash Proof. He re-released it in 2008, Crash Proof 2.0 or 2009, because he basically did a post-mortem on what he said would happen. He accurately called it for the right reason. And then he wrote a follow-up book, which happens to be on my shelf behind me here, because we interviewed Peter yesterday for our crisis investing webinar that we're working on, uh, which is basically that the real crash, the big crash, was going to be the byproduct of what the Federal Reserve and uh, policymakers did in response to the 2008 crisis. Well, that, that day is now here. So in the last 10 years, I went from being a myopic estate investor with my nose against the grindstone, doing deals and worried about loan applications and optimizing equity. And I still, you know, you still do all those things. But I started really realizing that all my real estate investments, even my businesses, were floating in an economic ecosystem on an ocean. And underneath were currents and waves and forces that I couldn't see and barely understood. Above me were winds and storm clouds and things off on the horizon that I, I couldn't see until I got closer. And so the, the metaphor 
or is it an analogy? I always get those two confused. Anyway, and so I spent the last 10 years just reading tons of books and using our Investor Summit at Sea and the Real Estate Guys radio show as a way to get into as many relationships as I could with high level people, people like you know, Richard Duncan, who wrote The Dollar Crisis back in 2002 or three or whatever, and Robert Kiyosaki and Daniel DiMartino Booth and Chris Martinson and people who weren't really mainstream real estate people, but they had, you know, background in, in, in the Federal Reserve or they understood the uh, economics and they were PhD brainiacs. They didn't know anything about real estate investing. So we ended up having kind of this cool relationship uh, but through all of that, then I began to realize that, that you better be paying attention. I don't know if, if you're old enough, uh, Adam, to remember, but when I was a little kid, they had this game called Mousetrap. Remember the game called Mousetrap? Yeah. And, and so, you know, unlike these video games and stuff, this was like a physical thing. It was a board game. You constructed it and it had this whole elaborate mac mechanism where you start a marble, it goes down this chute, it hits this lever that has a boot and it hits another thing and a bucket tips over and all any at the end of it the little trap comes down and captures the mouse i don't remember what the object of the game was but what i learned was there was a mechanism and something can start way far out that you can't see and it goes through this whole convoluted mechanism that you don't really understand but if you're not paying attention down comes the trap and that's what happened to me in 2008 and so I left with a mission. I was a lot less concerned with how much money I could make and how fast I could make it. I became much more concerned with how to preserve what I had, to grow what I had past inflation, and to make sure that I had built a resilient portfolio, not just a, a, a fat portfolio. Because on paper, in 2008, I was a multimillionaire. But in reality, I was poor and I didn't know it because I didn't have any passive income. It was all equity. And when the equity went away, I had nothing except negative cash flow. And then I became, I realized I was poor. And that's where I doubled down on my fandom of Robert Kiyosaki, really began to appreciate his cash flow message. And I understand now the relationship between cash flow and equity and how to use cash flow to create equity, how to har use cash flow to harvest equity and reposition equity. So the stuff we wrote about in our book still makes sense, but you also have to make sure that you're ready for the unexpected because as we're experiencing right now, things that you can't even conceive of can hit you and you can't survive everything. I mean, an asteroid could hit the earth. You're not going to survive that. There's things that could happen that you have no control over. But if you're structured properly, you can be pretty resilient against some very difficult circumstances. What makes you be able to be structured properly to be able to be resilient? Um, I hear one obvious piece is that cash flow, but is, is that the only thing? Is there something that the listener will take away and say, man, if I, if I do it the way, the way Russ had it in 2008, I'm screwed. But if I do it this way, I'll be resilient. Yeah. So to me, uh, I actually came up with a whole portfolio strategy I call strategic real asset investing. And I asked myself the question, knowing what I know now, if I could go back in time, what would I have done differently? And if you look at a typical asset allocation model that a financial planner would give you, they diversify or they, they hedge risk through diversification. So you'll have some bonds which benefit from deflation and produce income and, you know, put you in front of the equity so you don't get, um, you know, you don't take the losses. Uh, you, you invest in stocks, which give you the upside for inflation and, um, you know, can pay, pay you some dividends. You get a chance to share in the profits, but it's a little bit more volatile. Uh, then you have money market accounts and CDs and maybe some insurance instruments where you diversify even outside of the banking risk because I think most people understand banks balance sheets aren't really that solid. And if it wasn't for FDIC insurance, I think most people wouldn't go near banks. Insurance companies have stronger balance sheets backed by more real assets. You know, they tend to invest in things like real estate, A-class stuff. So, um, but the problem is it doesn't take into account co counterparty risk, 
doesn't take into account things like personal guarantees, which, you know, if you're in real estate investing, you get asked to sign those all the time. So uh, it completely leaves out anything that looks like an entity or asset protection plan that allows you to sign personal guarantees without putting any personal assets at risk. You only have as much on your balance sheet as it takes to be able to get the deal done. Um, the other thing I didn't understand at all was currency risk. One thing that I realized is that, especially Americans, they only know the world with the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. They only earn, denominate uh, their net worth and do business in the dollar. They don't have any plan B. And if the dollar were to go bad, and I think there's reasons to think it could, uh, especially with what's going on, uh, and especially if a other alternative shows up on the market, and there's been 10 years of a major power, a uh, couple of major powers collaborating to undermine the dollar at some point, if they pull that trigger, if they're in position, uh, that could be the other black swan, although it's not as black as COVID-19, because nobody saw COVID-19 coming. But at least you know, with a currency collapse, I think a lot of people who've been paying attention are, are concerned about it. But none of those things get talked about in a traditional financial planning environment. So a strategic real asset investing uh, portfolio plan takes all of those things into account. And that's where things like real assets like oil or energy, uh, agriculture, um, precious metals, diamonds, those things come into place because those are outside the banking system. You don't have counterparty risk. You can pivot into any currency you want. They're highly liquid. They're highly portable. I know some people like Bitcoin. I'm not, not sold, although I had a chance to buy it when it was like nothing and uh, probably should have, but it would have been pure speculation. I don't really consider it an investment. Candidly, I don't consider gold an investment, but you, things you have to have in your portfolio to serve specific functions. And then once you get past that foundation, which is a very, very important foundation, your entity structure and you know assets outside the system and firewalls between the more speculative things you do on the outer rings of risk, each ring being insulated. So the inner ring is very, very secure. Next ring out is a little riskier and you keep going out, but you, you don't you don't have everything organized so a personal guarantee takes you all the way from the outer ring of risk all the way to center. That's what happened to me. So once you've got that foundation in place, yeah, then, then you look at things like uh, positive cash flow, which of course, if you're an apartment investor, that's fairly easy because the lender is going to require it. When you're out there, you know, a lot of people starting in real estate start with single family homes and it's easy to get over levered in single family homes because there's a, a lot of cheap loans, high LTVs. You can subsidize the negative cash flow on the property with your personal income. And one day you wake up and you've got five, six, seven, eight homes that are all negative equity, negative cash flow. And the burden is hundred percent upon you and your paycheck or your business. And even if you're like I was, and you had a pretty healthy business and a fairly diversified business, you can still get wiped out pretty quickly. So making sure you have good, solid, positive cash flow, and, and, and I think apartment investing insulates you from that because the lender is going to require it. Uh, picking great markets and not just looking at the deal, but making sure you understand the market and having a great team because you know, I'm sure you know, that a great property in a great market with a crappy team is going to be a crappy investment. Very whereas, bad. <laughs> whereas a moderate market, a moderate property uh, deal it, 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 with a great team can actually perform. So team is to me is so much more important than deal. And a great market can solve almost any problem because you can switch out teams. It's hard to switch out markets. If the asset is in a bad market, there's not much you can do to affect the market. So to me, market selection is important. When I say market, I'm talking um, asset type, you know, sub niche like apartments or homes or apartments or hotels or industrial, whatever it is, you know, pick, yeah. pick the niche that makes sense. That's a market. Pick the demographic that you're going to be serving. Obviously, uh, serving millennials is different than serving senior citizens, which is different than serving um, industrial users in the distribution business versus retail. They're all very, very different demographics. They're all present in a marketplace, but marketplaces, like anything, tend to have personalities and they tend to be weighted in one direction and favor things. So, you just make sure you understand that. And then, you know, once you have a great market, then then the other big part is, is, is making sure your financing makes sense. I see people, you know, use HELOCs, for example, to borrow short to invest long. Big mistake. You should do it the other way around. You should borrow long to invest short. 
So lots of little things that I was doing wrong that are easily fixed once you're aware, but until you're aware are virtually invisible. And, you know, when, you, when you're when you new in real estate investing, sadly, you start with single family homes, which I think is one of the most dangerous places for a novice to play because you don't have the benefit of commercial lenders looking over your shoulder to make sure you don't step in something really bad. Where do you feel the market is right now? Speaking of COVID and things like that, where do you feel the market is right now and what should we be looking for? Well, again, the market's a big topic. That's demography, that's product niche, and that's geography. So, you know, but in general, the financial system, here's the way I look at it. There's the economy and there's the financial system. A lot of people can't figure the two out. I I explain it this way. If you're driving down the uh, road to riches, uh, and you're on your way to, you know, your big dreams, a pot of gold at the end of this, this road you're on. And you're looking at your odometer and your speedometer so you can see how fast you're going and how much ground you've covered. You can feel like you're making great progress if, if you know, the, the miles are ticking by and, you, you know, you've got good speed on your speedometer. But if you're not paying attention to your oil levels or your temperature gauge, Uh, you may end up having a breakdown in your system that is transporting you. Your your vehicle systems could be breaking down and and you don't see it. And by the time you see it, it's because your your economy or your engine is broken down. And, And so people, you know, can hear about how great the economy is and how things are booming, just like how great my cash flow or how great my balance sheet was and how much money I had. But until it gets stressed, you don't really know how fragile it is. So the financial system we operate in is very fragile. Everything that was wrong in 2008 is wrong now on steroids. And so that was one of the things that I came to learn going through from 2008 to to 2020 over the last 10, 12 years that I really paid attention to. So we've got a health crisis. I think everybody knows that. And the health crisis or the reaction to the health crisis, and forget whether you think it's real, forget whether you think it's serious, forget whether you think that all of the actions the authorities have taken are justified, constitutional or not, because nobody cares what you think. They're doing what they're doing and it is what it is. And so sometimes you have to set aside like your anger or frustration. I talk to people on both sides of the fence. Why aren't the, isn't the government doing more? Why aren't people doing more? Other people like, I believe they're destroying the entire economy when more people die from the regular flu than this, right? I'm not here to pass you one way or the other. At the end of the day, the health crisis became a lockdown. And a lockdown is like a heart attack. And if you can imagine that commerce is like blood circulating, it's like the heart beating and money currency is flowing through the economy like blood flows through your veins. We just had a giant economic heart attack, self-induced. We put ourselves in an economic heart attack and stopped all commerce. Problem is when you stop revenue, you create a situation where people can't pay their bills and they can't. Uh, they, they can't hire people, uh, certainly can't hire people. They have to let people go. They can't, and then those people can't pay their bills. And so you've got a financial system that's laden with debt, gobs of debt, tons of debt. And we've lowered interest rates all the way down to nothing. And we still have a hard time servicing the debt. We have lowered interest rates on the national debt so far. We still pay hundreds of billions of dollars a year just in interest. So, we, we can't lower interest rates any further, really. Uh, they're about as low as they can go. And productivity is stopped. So we're not going to increase income or capacity to make payments. Therefore, it seems inevitable that a lot of debt is going to go bad. Well, that was the genesis of what happened in 2008. We had a few subprime mortgage uh, borrowers who had ridden the coattails of easy money into non you know, ninja loans, no income, no job verification. Uh, 
and gotten those 228s where they get a two-year teaser rate and after two years it, it pops up and they were just speculating on the price of the property, assuming that real estate would go up, they'd flip out of the property or refinance and cash out their equity. To them, it was like, hey, if, I, if, if my credit improves or if my job prospects, my income improves, then I can refinance a property and get a 30-year you know, fixed loan and I'll be good. Or uh, I'll just sell the property and take my profit and go back to being a renter. There was a lot of that going on. I know I was in the business. Well, of course, you know, it didn't work out that way because at some point, some of those folks defaulted. And that wouldn't have been that big a problem. Ben Bernanke came out in 2009 and said, oh, the subprime crisis is contained. What he didn't know or purported not to know, what most people didn't realize is lurking under the depths of the economic ocean were these sea monsters or what Warren Buffett called weapons of mass financial destruction called derivatives. And the way derivatives work uh, they're, they're basically you rehypothecate or or lend multiple times against the same asset. So if you're a borrower, you take out a loan to buy an apartment building. That loan, that mortgage, is your liability. If I'm the lender, it's my asset. Of course, if I'm the lender, I'm not keeping that asset. I'm going to package it up into with a bunch of other mortgages into a mortgage-backed security, and I'm going to send it off to Wall Street. And so now it sits on somebody's balance sheet, a big bank, big institution's balance sheet as an asset. Well, they don't want to just let that asset sit there idly earning some pitiful little yield. They would never make that investment. So they got to maximize that yield through leverage. It's the same thing we do with real estate, right? If I can get a five to one leverage by putting 20% down on property and that property moves only 5%, at five to one, I get a 25% pop on my equity. My equity growth rate is 25% because I get, I get four pieces of the equity or the appreciation from the, the, the part secured by the loan and I get the 20%, I get the equity on my, my one-fifth, right? So that's kind of the way it works. If you do the math on it, you know, it'll, it'll check out. So anyway, so that's the way Wall Street works. So Wall Street would take that asset that they have on their balance sheet and they would pledge it now as collateral and they would borrow against it to get more cash. And then they would make more of these types of loans or they would go out and they would, they would do it again. And so the short of it is, is that you had all of these mortgage-backed securities levered through derivatives multiple times. So a one or 2% spread could turn into a 20, 30, 40, 50, 100% gain. The problem is, as you know, leverage is a two-edged sword. And so when the bonds started going bad or going down in value because of the subprime mortgage borrowers were defaulting at a higher rate than had been projected because they were all stamped AAA. I noticed you named yourself AAA too, by the way, that's catchy. So now these, these assets went down in value. The, the, the problem is when you use leverage in paper asset markets and, you're, and you're, the collateral goes down in value, you get what's called a margin call. Anybody that's ever traded stocks on debt knows you get a margin call. If the stock portfolio goes down, broker calls you up and says you either need to sell your stock at a loss, which you don't want to do, or you're going to need to bring more cash. Well, of course, people who are in the leverage game, again, I was one of them, they don't have any cash. They use nothing but credit. They rely upon healthy credit markets. And when credit markets start to fall apart, what happened to me happens to these big giant institutions. That's how Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, that's how all these companies went down after hundreds and hundreds of years in business because nobody understood how levered the system was. So, that same situation exists today, which is why the Fed can never raise interest rates. When you raise interest rates, just like um, rising cap rates mean declining values in, in, in apartment buildings, rising yields mean declining principal value on bond portfolios. And those bond portfolios are all levered. And so that, that's the catch-22 that, that the system is in right now. Very, very fragile. Now, it's all being held together by people making their payments. When you stop the entire economy, people can't make their payments. That debt is going to go bad. The difference between 2008 and today is the Fed and the government, and they're separate, by the way. The Federal Reserve is not part of the government. It's a private institution. If you're not clear on that, read The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. And then the, the federal government 
which is, you know, uh, the Congress and, and, uh, and the administration. So you've got fiscal policy, which is the government spending money hand over fist to get money into circulation. And then you've got monetary policy, which is the Fed lowering interest rates all the way to zero, didn't hesitate to do it, boom, 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 didn't even wait for a regular meeting, just take it all the way to zero as quick as we can, and then print as much money as the government can possibly spend and more. And by the way, we don't even have time for it to go through any trickle down. We're just going to inject it mainline directly into people's bank accounts, which was a joke that Milton Friedman made way back when, when he joked about helicopter money. That was never a serious policy. It was a joke. And yet that's exactly what we're doing today. Why are they so desperate to do that? Because they know this financial system will derail if those payments, Hertz just went broke, right? Hertz wasn't in trouble. Yeah, Penny, Sears, those companies, they were in trouble before. Retail was in trouble, but not Hertz. Hertz, 102-year-old company, broke. You know, they said no business was designed to sustain zero revenue. Well, if no business is, what state or nation is? None. So the question is, we've just had this massive heart attack. Is all of this money printing going to fix it? Have we bought enough time to get this thing kickstarted? Or have we been flatlining so long, going back to the body analogy, that, that we've now got permanent organ damage, permanent brain damage? Are these jobs really going to come back? Are we going to get 40 million jobs in the next four months? That's what we lost. Is that what we're going to get? Are we going to come back? Is that V-shape? Are we just going to go boom, boom? I don't think so. I don't think so because people's behavior has changed. Well, let's go back to real estate because this is about real estate. If, if you're a commercial, uh, if you're a business and you've been running an office for all these years and you have had a paradigm that you had to have your people all under a roof working together, collaborating, and now you've been forced by government edict to run your businesses with a remote workforce and you had a paradigm shift and you went, hey, you know what? This actually works. We figured this out. I don't need to pay rent. And people say, hey, you know what? I don't need to commute into the office. I don't need to live in this expensive real estate near the office. I can go move someplace less expensive where they don't tax me so much. I think some people have figured that out. There's some people that said, I, oh, I'll never shop online. I like to go to the mall. Well, guess what? They had to learn how to shop online. Do you think they're all of a sudden going to go back? I don't know. I think that people may have changed permanently. We'll find out. And then nobody really knows how deep the financial problem is going to be. So it goes from health crisis to economic crisis where payments and cash flow stops to financial system crisis where credit markets and banks are in trouble. Because these bankruptcies are going to land on somebody. I mean, somebody's writing off a whole lot of debt. And then if the Fed decides that nobody's going to take the hit and they're going to suck it all up, they're going to have to print trillions of dollars. Their balance sheet is, and for those of you who don't know, the Fed's balance sheet is basically an indicator of how much money they've conjured out of thin air. So in 2007, 2008, it was $800 billion. At the end of like 2011 or 12, it was $4.5 trillion. That's what it took to get us out of 2008. They started the taper and brought it down to like 3.7 trillion and the economy was already starting to sputter. And so they reduced course, dropped interest rates, stopped tapering, started easing again. And that was all before COVID. Then COVID came and they just topped 7 trillion. They're just over 7 trillion. So they nearly doubled from 3.7 to over 7 in four months, when they were doing quantitative easing the first time, they were printing $85 billion a month, which is a trillion a year, and that was considered extraordinary. They're doing 100 to $200 trillion, a billion a week, right? That's ridiculous. So all that pressure now goes to the dollar. So health crisis to economic crisis to financial system crisis to dollar crisis. Meanwhile, you have... The Chinese and the Russians have been working together for 10 years to de-dollarize the world. And if the U.S. dollar stops being the world's reserve currency, are Americans ready for that? Uh, most of them don't even know what that means, much less are ready. They're not hedged for it in any way, shape, or form. So that's the big thing that people don't understand. The rest of the world knows how to get along outside the dollar because they do. They use the dollar the way Americans use gold. 
as just a place to park money that isn't their own currency. But Americans earn, do, denominate, do everything in dollars in any other way. And if the dollar socially changes like it did in 1971, that's where we got you know, high interest rate. We were a creditor nation. We had a strong manufacturing base. And we, could, we were able to absorb that hit. Today, we're in a much weaker position. We're the largest debtor nation. We already have interest rates at zero. Can you imagine if they had to jack interest rates up to 20% to save the dollar? So yeah, I don't know what the answer is, but these are all the things that are on my mind and the things we're talking to people about. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom because I do believe on the flip side of every opportunity or every crisis is opportunity. Uh, there's going to be a lot of distressed assets. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to fix problems for people, clean up messes. Um, but you got to be positioned. I think, you know, having your current portfolio structured well with solid cash flows and good markets and good teams, anything on the margin, I would jettison. I would definitely be locking in long-term financing on properties that you want to keep. I'd be liquidating as much equity as you can get your hands on because the amount of interest you have to spend to carry that as an insurance premium if you have to pay it. And you probably could arbitrage a little bit, meaning you can borrow cheap and lend for more. And uh, that probably is going to end up becoming even easier to do as credit markets start to tighten up. There's going to be a bigger market for private debt. So if you have access, if you can borrow money at three or four or five percent and loan it out at seven, eight, nine, ten percent, that's a good, safe, conservative cash flow, especially if it's collateralized by assets, you'd be happy to take in a foreclosure, 20, 30, 40 percent protective equity. And I think there's going to be a lot of those opportunities. So it's not doom and gloom, but there's a lot to think about for sure. Last question. It can be it can be fairly short if the answer's short before we get into the final five. You probably but, figured out I don't do short, but I'll try. <laughs> where, where do we park the equity? And, and I mean this because I've, I'm going back and forth with coaching clients and trying to, trying to support at the best level possible. And it's really difficult right now to understand because in many ways, it feels right to, to get the equity out of things to to sell things and to and to park cash uh, actual dollars US dollar um, and then on the flip side at the exact same time it feels like if the dollar does lose value then everything else increases eh, foe increases in value or it seems to increase in value uh, as the dollar loses um, so the question would be should we be putting more money into something like gold where it'll preserve the rate? Should we leave it in real estate where, um, where if the dollar loses value, the real estate tends to go up or it seemingly goes up? Or should we actually get that cash and see what we can do with it? What are your thoughts? So my favorite strategy right now, I actually started teaching this uh, two or three years ago. We did a conference called Future of Money and Wealth. And, uh, you know, we were dealing with these same issues because this was a bunch of us all looking at the future. Some of the big names that I've referred to, um, we put that conference on because we wanted to pick their brains on the front end of our annual investor summit at sea. And we were like, okay, based on what we see, what's coming, what do we think how, how do we want to play this? What's a good financial strategy? So as a financial strategist, here's what I came up with. I said, well, imagine you've got, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of equity in a, in a property that's accessible. And so you go and you borrow out that equity and let's say you do it at 4% and you lock it in 30 year fixed, you know, just on your interest expense, not counting your, you know, amortization payment. So this is not necessarily about cash flow. This is just interest expense. Uh, at 4% for it's $8,000 a year of interest, which is deductible because you're going to use it for investment purposes. Um, so let's, but let's just use gross numbers and forget about the tax consequences because those will vary from person to person. Um, so you, you've got uh, $8,000 a year going out. If you take half the proceeds, $100,000, and invest it in first position trust deeds, on little greenhouses in cash flow markets, um, affordable cash flow markets, and say you were to purchase two $50,000 first trust deeds on $80,000 properties at 8%. 
When you underwrite it, you know that the rents on those properties will easily make that payment and give you your 8% yield. With 30% or what, $30,000 of protective equity, um, you would, you're, you're hedged against deflation. The property values could go down 30% and you'd still be break even. If you foreclosed, you would happily take the cash flow because presumably there's enough meat on that cash flow bond or uh, uh, cash flow to, to provide you uh, the yield on your debt and also provide the uh, investor or the owner occupant, you know, but let's say investor, a profit for operations and whatnot. So the, the, the point is, is that it's, it's relatively safe. Now you're hedged against deflation. You also own an asset that would benefit from, or you have potential to own an asset that would benefit from inflation. So if you get deflation first and then inflation, that's fine, right? But most importantly, I've got $100,000 invested at 8%, which is generating $8,000 a year of interest income against my $8,000 a year of interest expense. So I'm break even on the cash flow, but I only had to use $100,000 out of the $200,000 of proceeds. So I got $100,000 free and clear. Now I could take that $100,000 free and clear and I may split that into two $50,000 slices. Oh, by the way, on the two $50,000 loans, you've diversified your streams of income, two different of collateral. You could even go two different markets if you wanted to, uh, two different borrowers. And so, you know, could they both go bad? Yeah. But there's a possibility only one would go bad and you'd only have to deal with one at a time. And the other thing is, two, marketplaces that are affordable are probably going to be the recipient of migration as people who are moving from more affor- expensive places move to more affordable places if we do have tough economic times. So I like affordable housing, both as a lender and as an investor. Okay. Now I got this other hundred thousand. I split, I take 50,000, I buy gold, I stick it in my safe. What have I got? No counterparty risk, no currency risk. I, I, and I'm hedged against inflation. If the dollar lapses, I got $50,000 that could easily quadruple. And now that pays off my old debt. So I, I own as a free and clear asset, right? And possible that gold could quadruple. Sure. I mean, the last time the dollar collapsed, it went from 35 to 850. From 2000, whatever, it went from 250 to 1700. Bank of America just came out a couple of weeks ago. They, they upped their, uh, their target for gold from 2000 to 3000, a 50% increase. And the title of the report was The Fed Can't Print Gold. Bank of America. All right. So then you take the other 50,000 and you might put it in real estate, but I would put it in real estate that is geographically insulated. So I like agriculture. The reason I like agriculture for two reasons, especially offshore agriculture. One is it's offshore, which means that it's hard for people to get their hands on it uh, in, in, in case there's litigation, lawsuit, debt collections, whatever. Number two is there's no debt, which means there's a lot less air. Just going back to 2008, for those of you that were around, uh, Texas had some and still has some rules about cash out refinances and loan to value. So there was less air in Texas real estate than there was, say, in California, Florida, or Arizona real estate. And so when the air came out, California, Arizona, and Florida prices fell precipitously, whereas Texas fell a little bit. That's the difference between when there's a lot of air or a little bit of air. If you go into a a, a marketplace, any real estate where there's no air, there's no financing available in that market, if financing comes, you're going to get a big boost in the arm, right? You're going to get a big equity pop because all of a sudden now all that purchasing power is going to come in. If it never comes and then lending goes away, you don't have as far to fall. But the other thing that's great about agriculture is you don't have to get the geography right. You got to get the commodity right. It doesn't matter where the hungry mouths are. As long as the produce can be grown and shipped to wherever those hungry mouths are, whether it's China, India, Russia, EU, or the United States of America, it doesn't matter. You own something that's real, that is essential of universal value and can be sold in whatever currency is working at that particular time. So that's a very, very simple hedge strategy that incorporates the elimination of counterparty risk, hedging against inflation, hedging against deflation, being short the dollar in both gold and debt, And then also benefiting from inflation on the real estate side of things and getting a little bit of asset protection diversification. Not that complicated when someone explains it to you. Took a little while to kind of think it all through, but it's one of my favorite things in this current environment. 
Awesome. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with the final five. What's Blue Spruce Boardroom? It's Adam Adams' private inner circle program that helps serious investors take their businesses to the next level. With 24-7 access to our private Facebook community, exclusive mastermind retreats held at luxurious resorts around the country, bi-weekly coaching calls, education, support, and monthly meetings, this is the full immersion you need in order to get from where you are to where you want to be in your real estate business. When you join Blue Spruce Boardroom, you'll become close with Adam and the other members of this exclusive inner circle. You'll meet accredited investors, deal sponsors, high net worth key principals, as well as real estate influencers. The perfect combination for you to take your business to the next level. Apply today by following the link in the show notes. And we're back with the Russell Gray. And Russ, what's the most creative deal you've ever done? Well, trying to give you a short answer. Uh, I don't know. There's three. So I'm not going to say maybe it was the most creative, but it was my favorite. Uh, I took $50,000 out on a, a cash out refinance, one of my favorite techniques of a property in California, where I got a tax deduction for doing that. And then I bought in a one-tenth share in a $500,000 uh, resort property condominium on the beach in Mexico. And then for that $50,000 share, I got three weeks a year of use, which was worth about $2,000 a week. Uh, so it's like a free vacation. I got one-tenth of the income for the times that it wasn't being used by the owners, which was about $2,000 a year. And so when you took the income and the tax deduction and combined it with the debt, I basically got the condo for free and uh, ended up diversifying my equity out of California into Mexico where there was no debt. So that was kind of a fun little deal. What book do you recommend? Um, depends on what you're trying to learn. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I would say one of the books that I probably end up quoting the most that isn't a book that a lot of people talk about anymore, but I still think is a great book, is Good to Great by Jim Collins. I think it's a great way to figure out your investment philosophy, even though it's about business. It's a way to think about the role of culture and some of the basic principles of what greatness is. If you treat your real estate investing like a business, then you probably would rather be great than good. And Jim Collins' epic work, Good to Great, is a, is a classic you'll get a lot of value out of. Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, grinding. I love it. I, I'm on a mission. Uh, you know, our mission is education for effective action. My personal mission is to empower individual freedom through financial education for effective action. Um, I've got kids and grandkids that are inheriting a world that has a lot of issues. Uh, even though I'm an older guy, uh, I still feel like I got a good 20, 25 years of hard work to go. So five years from now is um, still cleaning up some of the messes, believe it or not, from 2008 capitalizing on some of the new opportunities being created in the new, uh, the new environment. But, uh, you know, my, my goal is not just to survive, but to thrive and to do it in a way that adds a lot of value to other people. So I'll be doing that then. I'm, that's what I'm trying to do now. And what is the best way for the listener to find you or get a hold of you? Uh, probably just, you know, the, the podcast. If people want to read, you know, I do a, a, a weekly commentary uh, in, I talk mostly about what I see in the news and how it relates to real estate investors. So if you send an email to newsletter at realestateguysradio.com, newsletter at realestateguysradio.com, you'll get the latest edition, you'll get put on the list, and then, uh, then you'll get pointed to our podcast and our website and every other way you could think of, of uh, hearing more from us if you're interested. Awesome. And that'll be in the show notes. So if you are a listener, you're driving and you didn't quite get that, just scroll down click it and you'll be able to go straight in copy the newsletter at real estate radio guys not real estate guys radio real estate, i said it backwards yeah it happens I'm, all the I'm time i'm dyslexic <laughs> newsletter at real estate guys radio.com perfect it's in the show notes right now so you can scroll down and click russ thank you for your time you uh i want to be respectful of your time you gave so much value to our listeners and that was exciting to go through the way that uh, an econ somebody who's a real financial strategist um, thinks. Uh, just, I mean, I'm, I'm basically speechless, so I apologize for doing that. <laughs> and, but that was awesome. I really loved that. Thank well, you. I appreciate you having me and giving me a chance to uh, ramble on a little bit. Hopefully people got some value out of that.
Lots of value. I'm going to let you go, but until next time, my friend, think outside the box. As a reminder, any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are for accredited investors only. And if you're interested in working with me and my team, then go to realbluespruce.com and click get on the list. It's that simple. Just click get on the list to start passively investing. This has been an episode of the Apartment Investing Show with me, Adam Adams, all rights are reserved. And if you haven't done so already, then make sure that you absolutely smash that subscribe button and I'll see you on the next episode.